Hi, everyone. Welcome to our program today. History Programming Assistant Pete is going to share information on old fashioned photography and, and the evolution of photography. So I'm going to have Pete introduce himself and I'll have him take it away. Thank you very much, Pete. Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm a seasonal employee. Uh, this is the I'm finishing up my third season at the Agricultural Heritage Center and uh, over the past couple of years, well, I wrote an article about the history of photography and also in general, how it was connected to the time period that we interpret here at the Ag Center. And I'm gonna focus specifically on a, a photo album that um, one of our volunteers actually donated to us a uh, season before last. And so talk about the history of photography and how it's, developed from its very first years all the way up to the present time where of course most people are now taking you know photos all the time with their smartphones you know and even digital cameras which were the last camera to sort of develop in the 1980s are sort of falling by the wayside too with most people using um, you know smartphones so this is actually the um, album that uh, our volunteer donated to us. And it's interesting because there were companies that made lots of money um, on these, making these for people so they could display their photos. Some of them were small like this, and some of them were very big. But this company, which was called WW Harding, and you can see the title page, um, actually was out of Philadelphia. And they made their money not only on photographic albums, but on family Bibles. So both things that you would have around your house, probably often in your living room, you know, or you'd have photos that were taken mostly in this time period where you would go to a photo studio and have your photos taken. And um, also then you would have it next to the family Bible, which, you know, had pages in the beginning where you talk about, you know, when important days when people were born, baptized, when they passed away, those kinds of things. So I'm gonna talk about the kinds of photos that are in here. And you can see it says there's an index here that says index to fo the photographs. Well, unfortunately, there's no information about these people. I mean, our volunteer knows that they were related but doesn't know anything else about them. And unfortunately, nobody ever wrote anything in. The interesting thing that I'll talk about a little later is that the information about the photographers themselves was almost always evident. And that's because one, because of advertising, they would want people to you know, come back and have more pictures taken by them. And then also if you wanted copies made of the photographs, if you needed more than one. Now this first one I'm going to talk about, well, first I'll talk about a little about um, the history of photography. So the first uh, photograph that was developed is called the daguerreotype. And that was actually developed in France in 1839. And there actually is a photographer who is represented in here. We don't have any daguerreotypes in this album, but one who actually started, it looks like that this album, um, because of the photo photographers listed, it started out with people, this family having their pictures taken in Vermont and then actually moving uh, westward. And so the first photographer who is, who is represented in here actually did take daguerreotypes about nine years after they were invented. But as I said, there are none in here. There, it is interesting that daguerreotypes, at the time, you couldn't make copies of them. They were unique images. I mean, today we could make copies of them. You know, we can either take another photograph of them or, you know, if we have a copy, can, you know, copy them on a copy machine or something like that. But the back then you couldn't. But this first image, which is of this little boy, and actually we'll talk about him too, because there's a few images of him through the catalog and we can see how he actually gets, you know, older, the years pass. So as I said, this is a tin type, but most people refer to it as tin type, but it's, and this is a blow up of that photo. So I'll show that as well, a little easier to see. And 
they were actually ferrotypes, and ferro means iron. So they weren't actually on tin, they were on what's called japanned iron. And it's a piece of iron that's just hammered really, really, really thinly. And then you would put the photographic emulsion on it. The other thing is that these tin types, they were like daguerreotypes in that you could not make copies of it. It was just the, you'd put the tin type in the camera, take the picture, and then you would develop it. But the, the good thing about it was for photographers was you could do this all in a very short period of time. And then you could, you know, take a picture of somebody. I mean, it wasn't like an instant camera, but within a few minutes, they would go into their little dark room and develop the photo and then give it to the people. And then I will show you a little later when we talk about the kinds of uh, photographers that did tin types as opposed to studio photographers, a little more about that as well. So anyway, um, it would come out of the camera and you could show it, to the, uh, show it to the person and hopefully sell it at the time. Now, some of these photographers who went around who did tin types, they went from place to place and were almost like traveling salesmen. They'd go to somebody's house and say, would you like your family photos taken? And sometimes they would set up at you know street fairs or on the main street of a of a, a town. Or sometimes photographers who did have studios would do tin types as well. Now the second type of one that I'm going to talk about, which is the one that's there are many more of in this uh, catalog. I mean in this um, album, excuse me, are called carte de visa, which is actually a French name. And that was the first photograph that was taken in what the kind of process that most of the 20th century was, which means you had a negative in a camera and you took the picture, you took the negative out, you went into your darkroom and you developed it. And then you had a negative and then you put it in an enlarger and then you could make as many copies as you wanted to. Now, the interesting thing is about carte de visa was that they were really, you could see that was not very small. Here's a larger image of one that we actually blew up as well. Now you really can't tell it from, these are actually just copies made off the, uh, the printer, but these looked not, the colors were not as vivid as the tin types were. And so what you would do is most of these were made in the same size as calling cards because also back in the 18th, 19th and 20th century, people would go and visit. They'd go to see their neighbors or their relatives. And if they weren't home, you'd have a little basket by the front door and you just leave your card. So when they came back home, they'd say, oh, you know, Aunt Helen visited. Well, they just started doing the same thing with these photographs. So you could leave them for people. Of course, then you could trade them like you might to get together with friends and say, oh, here's a picture. Here's some pictures of my relatives and you give me pictures of your relatives. And so they were, and so you could make as many. And as I mentioned earlier, the photographer's name was on the back and it would often give his address. And it would also, it would be like, say something like, you know, for the next following year, if you wanna make more copies, just contact, you know, the photographer and he'll make copies for you. And um, so let's see what's next. So the interesting thing is there were a lot of photographers who did have studios in different towns. Let's say maybe a photographer in Longmont may have also had a studio in Boulder. And the reason they did that was because they didn't want people to travel really long distances and they could get more, you know, because a lot of people when they lived out in rural areas, I mean, you know, they only had a horse and buggy or a horse or something like that to get there. So they would also often do that. And some of these photographers also, there's a history of them moving west, just like a lot of the pioneers did, just like Mr. McIntosh did, you know, because they would follow people and people would be settling new families. And then there would be an impetus for them wanting to record their, you know, photographic um, history again. And of course, this wasn't done very often. You know, you might take, one or two photographs a year. You get dressed up just in the same kind of clothes you wear to go to uh, church. 
and you'd go and you might have, you know, one photograph taken every maybe few years or something like that. And there is evidence in this photographic book of images of people getting, you know, at different times. And I'm actually going to show you through the blow ups. This woman, the one on, you know, your, your right side, my left side, um, actually is in this photo album many, many times. And this is another picture of her. And there are pictures throughout that look like maybe they date from maybe when she was in her 30s, maybe to her 60s. So she is the most evident person in the photographic um, album of somebody being having pictures taken through the years. And this young boy that I showed you first will kind of end up with the last picture of him when he was actually a young man. Another interesting thing is some of these photographers were actually kind of famous. There was this one photographer who is represented in our catalog. His name is Zachary Roberts. And he actually, for a while, had a studio in Northfield, Minnesota. And if anybody knows about Wild West history, that was the great Northfield raid where Jesse James and the um, younger brothers came and uh, robbed a bank, you know, because they mostly did that in places like Missouri but they went way far north. And actually that was kind of the demise of both gangs and many of them were killed. So this photographer became famous or infamous because he actually took pictures of these uh, dead younger uh, brothers after they had been killed in this robbery. So, and that's another thing. Quite often, we don't have any representation of this, but quite often, if you had a family member who died, quite often you may not take them to a funeral home, but you would have them, as they say, laid out in the parlor. And often the casket would be open and there might be family members standing around the casket. So it'd be like the last picture of the person taken before they you know, were buried in the ground. Uh, So I had mentioned earlier that there were itinerant photographers who moved around from place to place. And then there were the photographers who had the studios. And of course, they invested a lot of money in their studios and they were considered part of the you know, business uh, community. And you know, they hired people to help them. And this is an example, a picture of what a typical studio looked like, probably more of a high scale studio, but you can see all the windows there because they didn't really, you know, they didn't have a whole lot of artificial light. So you had to have a lot of windows to actually, you know, get enough light so you could take the photographs. And then you can see the photographer standing there. And of course, all the cameras they used were big box cameras that took a very, very large uh, image and uh, negative. Now, in opposition to them, there, as I said, there were these itinerant uh, photographers. And this is an example of somebody who just has his tent set up on the city street. And you can see that he's got his name and he says he's, you know, selling tin types. And so people would, you know, this is probably people who just had their photographs taken. And you can see the the bulletin board there with little examples of the photographs. And sometimes they were even more uh, portable than that. This is another itinerant uh, photographer and it's a very small card, but he would, you know, it's not big enough for him to go inside and do his developing. He probably just had a dark space in there where he would, you know, put his hands inside. He really couldn't see what he was doing and then develop. So, one of the issues that came up between these two kinds of photographers, the ones that traveled around, opposed to the ones who had established photo studios, was that the established photo studios didn't want their market invaded by these people who would just come through. So they would tell stories and say, you know, it's not as good a quality as a photograph. And if you want copies made, you only can have one copy. And they also would say, well, you know, often they would come to a person's house and say, let me take a picture of your little kids. And he said, you know, no obligation, doesn't cost anything. 
And so they would take a picture and show it to it. And then of course the family would be like, oh, we'd love that. And then they say, well, they would hold the picture ransom you know, because then they'd say, oh, look, you know, now they're charging us too much money for, so we can get the image back. And they actually called them kidnappers. And then also in towns, you know, I showed you that picture of that person sort of set up by, it looks like maybe a, a courthouse or something. There were actually uh, photo photographers who lived in towns and had studios and said to the city council, You've got to ban these people. They can't come, you know, you've got to pass a law so they can't even come into our town and take photographs. And actually, a fair amount of towns did that. I don't know if there was ever any legislation in Boulder County about that, but it did happen quite often. So the other thing was that this was tintypes actually lasted up until the 1930s through the depression and probably until the beginning of World War II when it really kind of dropped off because these companies that sold these little traveling, you know, like dark rooms and cameras and all the supplies and chemicals, they would advertise in newspapers and tell the young men, you can be your own boss, you know, and you can travel the country and see the country, you know, and nobody has to tell you when to punch a clock or anything like that. And you can go around and, and, and do this. And actually a lot of, as I said, a lot of people did that do, it was most, it was probably the vast majority were young men. And they did it through the, you know, the um, uh, time of the depression. Now, the other question is that comes up a lot, particularly people ask when they visit, uh, you know, our farmhouse, the lower farmhouse here, is why don't people smile? And there are a lot of different theories, you know, and there is in this, in this uh, um, album, there is not one person smiling anywhere. And some people, you know, the usual theory is, well, the, the, you had to hold still for so long and it's hard to hold the smile. I mean, you know, you can really, your, your muscles around your mouth can ache really quickly so that people didn't do that. But that's true because some of the types of photography that was taken, you did have to stay still. And they actually would have these neck braces that they'd put at the back of your neck to hold you still. Because you may be, I don't have any images like this, but you may have seen a, a, a photograph someplace where a bunch of people are standing and there might be an image of a dog down at the bottom or a little child. And it looks kind of ghosty, like you can sort of see through it. And that's because those were the kind of photographs that were longer exposures. So sometimes you didn't get the whole image because they actually moved before they finished taking the photograph. But then there were other types of photographs that you could take just as quickly as you can with a smartphone. Just click the button and it's done. So there's quite a, some theories are because photography, well, when it comes to portraiture, it comes out of portrait painting. And of course, there were itinerant painters, particularly, you know, in New England, before and during and after the revolution, that would go around before photography and say, you know, I can paint a picture of, you know, your family together. And of course, you'd have to stay still for even longer periods of time. And also, it was considered very serious. And because you dressed up for that, it was considered not a good idea to smile. In fact, I read an article that said that because a lot of the wealthy tended to have their paintings uh, painted, you know, as opposed to, you know, farm workers. And of course, there wasn't much of a middle class in the early part of this, uh, of, the, of the country's history that it was, because it was considered serious build business, if you smiled, that it meant that you were either drunk or maybe crazy. And also there's this other thing that smiling has progressed. And of course today, nowadays, you know, we'll say cheese or Canada, you know, and cheese is actually a term that people started using in the 1940s to smile. And I came across another article that Somebody went through and analyzed, I guess, hundreds and hundreds of high school yearbooks from 1900 to 2000 and looked at all the senior boys and girls and that they noticed through the century 
people started smiling more and more. So we are in a place where that's just kind of happened. And that girls in this study seem to smile more broadly than boys did. And then there's one final thing. If you notice, if you ever look at Vogue or any of the other fancy uh, fashion magazines, almost always, you know, whether it's a male model or a female model, they aren't really smiling. You know, they always talk about the poutiness of models. Well, that may have been something that was a leftover from the time of painting, but it also is because supposedly the fashion designers don't want their clothes distracted from by somebody looking at our own oh, nice smiling face. So that's why they kind of don't smile. Now, of course, all these photographs I've been talking about have to do with photography where you go someplace, put on your Sunday best, you know, the photographer has a bunch of backdrops like we use in Zoom today, you know, so we don't have to have some plain Jane thing, you know, maybe some kind of exotic palm trees or something. So they would have those kinds of things so people could put behind them, or they might have a fancy looking chair to sit in, you know, or something like that. So of course, then people did that. But with the period of time that we interpret for the Agricultural Heritage Center is the time when people started doing personal photography. And that is because of one name, you know, and probably the older people will remember Kodak, but probably, you know, people who, you know, live, you know, were born in the 70s or after may not have much memory. So this actually is a Kodak camera and it's a much smaller camera. We have a camera that's in the uh, living room that is a bigger type, which is more typical that families bought. But essentially, you know, you could go to the drugstore or even, you know, from out of your Sears and Roebuck catalog, order film, put the film in here, and then you could take a picture whenever you wanted. Of course, people still took pictures more of special events, like some of the photographs we have down in the living room and parlor, you know, people standing in all their Sunday best out in front of their front porch or something like that. But Kodak did this because they knew they could make a lot of money, but they wanted to tell people to capture happy Kodak moments. And so um, that developed more and more and through history. Now we also, we don't have one of these. This is actually the next development that came out about the same time between 1910 and 1920, when we talk about um, the period here. This is actually a Kodak movie camera. And it essentially, all it is, is taking individual negatives and running it past the lens with a little motor, you know, and then you could take photographs. And then you would develop that and then you would have a short film, you know, maybe a minute long. And of course, it has a winding mechanism. And if I can get this to work, there we go. You crank it up, cranks up sort of like a little old fashioned Victrola. And then you, and you can hear that noise. And that's actually moving the film past the lens and you're taking the picture. And of course, the way that you would line things up, if you're looking at something far away, you would use this, these two, this two-piece lens where we'd have a viewfinder and then farther away would show you exactly what you're shooting in. And if you're like close up to somebody, you would actually just look here and it comes out right, oops, you look in here and then it comes out right here. Now this little camera is similar in the sense that it has one of the ones that you actually look in here and then out here. And of course the bellows is because that creates a larger depth of field. So you can focus, you know, either really close in or far out. So you could either take, you know, somebody's portrait or you could take a landscape. But Kodak developed this, it's, it was actually called the vest pocket camera because you see when you close this up, it's really not that much bigger than a smartphone. Now, of course, you'd only have about maybe 10 photographs on each one of these when you'd have to change. 
but it also had this interesting little thing in the back. You can see this door and you could open up the door and get this open. And there's a little, there would be a little stylus here. So it actually could write on the back of each negative, you know, that this would be, you know, uh, Brother Joe. And so when it got developed, you know, then you could identify them. The other thing is, because of the time this came out, just before World War I, is that a lot of soldiers took this to war. And of course, you could just put it in your pocket. And these sold really well. I did a little research on them recently, you know, and in a period of just a couple of years, they sold over 2 million cameras. So that was a period, it was probably as big a change as we have had with going from regular digital cameras to smartphones. Now, of course, there's something else you may wonder, well, all the photographs in the past are black and white, and why is that? Well, the reason is because they just didn't have the technology to make color until around the turn of the century. Although there is one exception, there is this, it's a mystery really. There was a um, minister in upstate New York, his name was Le Levi Hill, and he actually developed a process I was talking earlier about daguerreotypes being the first time, the first kind of uh, photographs. He developed a process to make colored daguerreotypes. And there are actually still about 60 of them. Um, Kodak actually has a museum, it's called the Eastman House Museum. And they have them there. They have to keep them in cold storage to preserve them. But nobody's been able to figure out how this guy in rural New York figured out how to make colored daguerreotypes. So to this day, there's only about 60 of them. But in the late 19th century, what they did was, you know, there's three different colors for the basic colors. There's red, blue, and green. And if you put those together, and then you have uh, your emulsion, which is the little things that are, you know, like little pieces of silver in the photography film that are sensitive to light, you can actually get those three different colors. And then when you lie them on top of each other, you end up with a color image. And of course, so that's how, but in the late 19th and early 20th century, it was called autochrome. Um, it was very expensive. So not many people had those kind of photos. But in 1935, Kodak came to the rescue of your average guy again, and they came out what was called Kodachrome. And some of you may have heard that song by Paul Simon called Kodachrome, bring me the nice bright colors. Well, that's really true because of all the different uh, color photography that's come out. And that was in 1935. It has proven to be the best over time. It has the most vivid, realistic colors. And if you don't keep it out in the light all the time, it'll stay preserved. But when they got into like the 40s and 50s and 60s, they made other kinds of films. Coda color, which was actually slide, or uh, excuse me, not slide film. Coda, Coda chrome was, Coda color was print film. So it was a color negative. But the problem was that all that chemistry wasn't very good. And if you have family albums that date from the 50s and the 60s, probably all the reds look kind of pink and all the colors have kind of just, you know, gotten more faint. And that's because, unfortunately, that was not really as good as, you know, now. And of course, then after World War II, they developed instant photography. And that was a fellow named Edwin Land. And you, most of you probably heard of the Polaroid camera. And you essentially, it was started out also um, actually, my father had one very early on, of course, it was before I was born, but they still had the camera that all it did was take black and white. It had all the chemistry and everything in a little packet. So you take the picture, you know, this is not one, but you'd pull the film out of the back and then it had a little cover and you were supposed to wait for it to develop and then you would open it up and then, then there would be the picture. And then actually in the 1960s, Polaroid did the same thing with color photography. 
But then, of course, in the 90s, they started working on uh, digital photography. And actually, Casio, which also made watches and a lot of other small electronic gear, was the first, it was the Egypt, um, Egyptian, a Japanese company, and they actually were the first ones to make digital photography. And of course, more and more digital uh, cameras came out and film got, you know, less and less used. Actually, I mentioned that uh, Kodachrome from earlier, actually about 10 years ago, there was only one place in this country, it was actually in Wichita, Kansas, that still did uh, processing for, for Kodachrome. But now that doesn't happen anymore. It's actually interesting. A lot of things, you know, everything old is new again. There are some, like with um, Polaroid, for quite a few number of years, nobody was making Polaroid film. But there actually been, have been some companies who've bought, you know, the process, the ingredients of how to put it together. And people are, you know, starting to buy instant, um, you know, cameras again. And also, there are schools and colleges that, you know, are having courses in photography so kids can actually learn how to take film with, with uh, you know, um, regular film photography and, and uh, develop it in the darkroom and then, of course, produce a picture. And there are some professional photographers who still prefer, you know, uh, the traditional photography and don't do digital. But digital, you know, has gotten so much better. I mean that when digital, when you, if you wanted a really good digital camera, say 20 years ago, you would have had to spend a lot of money and it would have been very sophisticated. Nowadays, every time a new, you know, group of cell phones come out, you know, like the next iPhone or the next, uh, you know, Google phone, they get better and better. And, you know, the technology that they put in the lenses just gets more and more and more and more amazing. And an interesting thing is that, now this is a little after the period we interpret, but in 1930, it was estimated that probably about a billion photographs were taken in the United States, which sounds like a lot. But I did find an estimate for, well, which actually now is almost six years ago, 2017, where they estimated that 1.2 trillion photographs were taken in a given year, which of course is more than a billion billion. And that with, I did, it didn't give numbers, but it, it was an article that was more recent that said practically every month, there are more photos taken in one month than there was in the first hundred years of photography. So we, you know, certainly take a lot more film today, but it's really wonderful that, you know, our um, uh, volunteer actually gave us these. And I'm going to talk a little more sort of ending with this image of the young boy um, when he was probably maybe 10 and then when he was 20. So again, there's that picture, which is a tin type that was taken, you know, maybe somewhere eight, nine, 10 years old. And of course, as you can see, he's just like everybody else in the period, dressed up in his Sunday best to have a picture taken. And, you know, he, he even has kind of a little frown on his face. So, you know, and of course it's a little easier to hold a frown than a smile. So the last photo photograph is the same boy and he's around 19 or 20. It's interesting because this is the only photograph. And let me see if I can find this here. Anyway, that has information about it. So it actually talks about how he had was coming home from work and passed the photographer's studio. And this is he's in his work clothes. He must have worked maybe as a clerk or something like that. And he went in. And the photographer, photographer said, well, let me take your picture. So he did. So the photographer or the young man wrote on the back, this is just an experiment of a picture of me coming home from work. So it's a little interesting, even though it's taken in the studio, it's sort of a candid because he hadn't planned 
which would, if you went to a photo studio, you would plan, you know, how you would dress and all those kinds of things. So this is a little like, well, you know, it's not a selfie in that he took it, but he came home, you know, he's on his way home, stopped in the studio and the, you know, photographer said, let me stamp your picture. And so this, the first picture in, he, in the, tab, in the uh, album is when he is about eight to 10. And this last one is kind of a early selfie when he's probably around 20. And I uh, hope you enjoyed that and thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Pete. That was great. Um, I, I hope everybody enjoyed and maybe this will make you think of some more questions you have about photography that you would like to look up and do some research for. Maybe you'd like to even try with your um, smartphone to even make them in black and white, make them look like tin types, like the old fashioned pictures. See what it's like if you smile, if you don't smile and, um, and different things like that. So it's just kind of fun to, to think about how photography has changed and how you know, how we see the world now and we saw the world then. Thank you. Yes, thanks.